first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Similia to invite Technique to give this keynote speech. We are a big user of Abacus, as you'll see in the presentation, and we uh, believe in the product going forward. Our company, uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, is quite large. It's de dedicated almost entirely to the oil and gas industry. 98% of our revenues come from the energy industry. We operate all over the world. We operate in 48 countries. Uh, and we have uh, one of the largest and newest fleets in the industry. As you can see on the bottom, our revenues are about $6.8 billion. That's about $9 billion, depending on the latest news from Greece and France and other places over in Europe to see what the exchange rate is. This gives you a breakdown of our company. Uh, it's split into three business units. This is a little misleading in that there's really uh, an offshore segment and an onshore segment. And the onshore segment is almost entirely uh, downstream, which is refining and uh, petrochemical. Uh, the offshore is almost entirely upstream. The offshore is split because the subsea part is the, the unit that has most of the manufacturing capability and the, operates the fleet. So it has the toys, the heavy assets. Therefore, they also have the best margins. The onshore side is mostly, and offshore is mostly exp, uh, EMP, meaning they are devoted to uh, engineering, procurement, construction, and installation. Whereas the subsea group has jobs that may last six months and be $100 million dollars the offshore group and the onshore group deal in projects whose scope is probably several billions of dollars and will go from anywhere from two years to five years. So that gives you an idea of why the company has been structured the way it is. It's more the nature of the business. As I was saying, the subsea business is vertically integrated. They manufacture many of the products they go forward and install. They manufacture products, as you'll see in the presentation, uh, flexible pipe, umbilicals, and they also manufactured what they call spoolable pipe. And we'll go into the details of that because the spooling operation is a big user of Abacus because it goes through plastic deformation. Uh, we also have the, the fleet that operates uh, and installs most of this equipment uh, all over the world. The offshore group, which is a little bit closer to my home, uh, deals with most of what I'll call first-of-a-kind type of projects all over the world. Uh, we, for instance, look at designing structures like spars that have to exist in the Barents Sea. And the Barents Sea is a rather hostile place to operate. Uh, three months a year you don't see anything because it's pitch black. All you do is hear ice crushing against your hull. And if anyone out there has a good simulation for ice and crushing of ice, I'd like to talk to you afterwards because we've been around the world looking for a good simulation for ice. And right now, it's still baffling, even the best, uh, on how to properly model that ice. And if you're somebody sitting on that spar or whatever structure it is in the Arctic at night, hearing that ice crushing, you want to know that somebody did the best job they could in designing uh, the structure. We also are looking at new technologies. Uh, the dry tree semi-submersible is uh, something the industry does not yet have. Most semi-submersibles have too much motion to support a riser system with a tree sitting on top, but the industry is closing in, and we're one of the companies that are doing that. And CFD analysis, as, along with uh, FEA analysis, is leading the way in that ability. We also build the largest things in the world. Uh, the next picture there was the floating LNG plant, the Shell's Perdido facility. And that is a five-year project. It's the first time they put an LNG liquefaction plant on a floating system with storage offshore and offloading directly to LNG carriers. That will be the largest vessel ever built by man. It takes the double wide, full length of the largest shipyards in the world to build. And finally, it's not always the cutting edge technology, but many areas of the world we have to deal with local content, meaning we have to be able to have the technologies that can be designed and built locally. And there is a picture of a TLP, which is cut several years ago considered very high-tech. Now it's being designed and built overseas. Onshore projects, again, are usually seen as very large and they're almost always sitting in deserts. I don't know why, but they always picture their plants in deserts. 
Uh, these projects usually take multiple years, and they usually require the, uh, the creation of uh, new cities in order to house the people to build the projects. Several years ago, many of you may recall that Gutter was building what turns out to be half the world's capacity in LNG. Uh, it was a series of projects. During that exercise, that city was built out in the middle of the desert in Gutter for 75,000 people, just construction. So these projects can get quite massive. Now I'm going to walk you through an offshore field uh, and uh, show you where uh, the technologies of FEA and CFD many times are employed. First, we'll start with the floater. That's an FPSO, spread moored, and it sits there with risers coming up to it and subsea fields laid throughout. One note on that subsea field laid throughout is there is more, one set of, or actually multiple sets of hydraulic lines that I'll point out to you that go down that keep that entire field active because that field, as you see it, if those hydraulic lines are lost, fail closed. Everything in there, every valve will fail closed for safety. First of all, we'll focus on the risers. You'll see three sets of risers there. The blue lines are water injection lines. The, the green are power and umbilical. That's what carries the hydraulic lines that keep that field up and running. And the red lines, which are always two lines, are the production, because the production lines will always be looping through the field in order to be able to pig the line and clear it of uh, debris. The next uh, picture that will come up is a production operation. I know it's a production operation because there's a red line. If it was a blue line, that would be a water injector. But this is a production tree that's going into a manifold, and the manifold is attached to a subsea tree. That boxy thing is actually a uh, subsea tree, and those in the business, I'll tell you, it's a horizontal tree. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. Uh, I'll explain it later. Uh, you'll also see facing you two more slots for lines to be tied in uh, for future development. And the next picture we'll show you is a water injection. The blue line terminates at what's called a pipeline end template. Many times you hear people call that a pipeline end manifold. The only difference is a manifold usually has a controllable valve, whereas a template is just usually straight pipe. In this case, the power umbilical, the green line, jumps over to that plet, so it's probably a plem. It probably has an active valve system on it. And you'll also notice there's a hard pipe jumper over to a tree, and that tree is an injection tree. I'll come back later and talk to you about that jumper. One more? Good. This here we're very proud of. This is actually a numerical wave tank. This has been developed really over the last two years. Uh, what you see there is a CFD code in the core. In this case, it's star CCM. And then you have what they call a transition zone. And outside of that, you have a linear Euler wave uh, domain that can extend as far as you want. So you can simulate an entire model basin and you only have the code that's necessary for the analysis right around the structure itself. And the transition zone or the blending zone actually will take the, uh, the reflections and the disturbances that are coming off the CFD analysis and blend it back into the Euler wave. And so you, essentially the Euler wave environment on the outside, which you don't see here, is an active boundary condition. And this now allows us to simulate all sorts of problems that we could not simulate before, and it's becoming more and more popular. And we're moving to try to create this as an uh, industry standard, the use of the Euler wave in the overlay method, because it's rather simple and straightforward. Here's two other applications of it. The one on the left is actually going to be uh, given an OMAE paper uh, this year. The, uh, it's a fixed structure, actually it's a fixed pile that was a model tested many years ago and very exacting model tests, so there's a lot of data and a lot of researchers like ourselves use it when we do CFD analysis in order to see how close we are. And it is of a breaking wave slamming into a pile, very hard to simulate uh, if you don't have a numerical wave basin, and we do. Uh, the one on the right is not a fixed structure, that is a spar. That is a spar in the northern North Sea, and that is a thousand-year wave being simulated, slamming into the top of that spar. What you don't see uh, on the spar, of course, is the top sides. The top sides would be sitting on those four columns that are spaced on the periphery. Uh, so 
the, the spars, decks, will never see any water in the, even in the thousand year storm. But what it does show is that there's a bulwark in the, towards the wave, and that's meant to keep or chop the wave down so not as much green water comes over the top. And after the client saw this particular simulation, they immediately said, put the bulwark all the way around because what the simulation also was doing was looking at the hydrodynamic uh, impact forces on all the kit and gear and the mooring winches and the risers that sit on top of that deck. And uh, the bulwark was able to uh, cut those forces considerably by orders of magnitude. So the use of the, uh, the numerical wave basin is here and it's real. Next, we'll talk about risers. Uh, the picture of the riser uh, is those who are, excuse me, a flexible pipe. Those people who are familiar with flexible pipe will realize that it's, it's an unbonded, it's not a composite, it doesn't have any resin in it. All these layers actually flex and move over its uh, life. Uh, most of the time that's only during installation, but some of these flexibles are also used in dynamic situations like risers. Uh, the, the inner lines are called volts. Uh, also the trademark with Z-lock and, and T-lock. Uh, they actually give the hoop stress, either from internal pressures or external pressures. And then you have the, uh, the armoring wire on the outside, which is flat wire. And you notice that there's, uh, there's crisscrossing, which gives you a torque balance so that your line doesn't kink on you. Uh, and there's been developed by our people in France tools over the years that enable us to ana analyze the load, especially in the armor. And Abacus was used to... Uh, uh, to do the analysis to actually as a validation tool so to validate our uh, other tools that we use. Next is the uh, termination. This is probably a combination of part art, part science. Uh, Abacus fortunately allowed a lot of the art to be displaced by science, but in the early days when we didn't have these uh, tools, uh, this was really an art. You have to terminate this flexible pipe into a hard uh, end fitting. And to do that, you have to crimp. And what you're seeing here is two uh, uh, half uh, crimpers are coming together. And by doing that, they're forcing down and uh, plastically deforming a polymer, which forms a seal. So the, the crimping does two things. It structurally connects it to the, uh, the end fitting. And also, it has to create a sealing mechanism that can withstand the pressures and, and also the composition of whatever the material is that's being run through the pipeline. Next, this is a, uh, a jumper. We saw one earlier in the first picture. This is an example of a fluid structure interaction. There's two parallel programs going on here, one looking at the flow. And if you've never seen the flow of an oil well, it's not nice and clean. They have gas pockets, water, so it's slugging, and, and, and uh, it really does shake, rattle, and roll all the time. Uh, and then uh, running in parallel to the CFD code, looking at the flow, is an FEA code with very, very small time steps. So that the information is passed back and forth, back and forth. The only way to get this to converge is very, very small time steps. And uh, it takes a very long time to, uh, to model. One of the stories I'll tell you right now about the oil patch over that 38 years is in the early days, it was very difficult to measure the, the actual orientation and distance of two hubs to drop a, a, a piece of pipe like this in. You notice these pipes are facing down. These pipes are actually cut. The final cuts are made on the deck of the vessel before they're lowered down and connected into two upward-looking hubs. Uh, we could not measure the, uh, the actual attitude until they came along with ultra-short baseline acoustics that would allow you to hit a target and tell you very precisely what the orientation and distance that one hub is relative to the other hub. And that made the architectures of the seafloor change overnight, because once you could measure these devices in very deep water, then all you, all you had to do is place it, place it, and you didn't have to be very particular about where you placed it, because then you simply came back and were able to uh, cut and drop. Before then, you had to have huge devices that would grab something and try to orient it in the proper direction. This probably, that one invention probably had more to do with the advancement of subsea than any other, except for one that's coming up a little bit later. Okay, uh, we have risers coming off the seafloor. Eventually, they have to connect to a moving platform, which is never an easy piece of business. 
Uh, in the old days, when we had fixed jackets, we had what's called J-tubes. It was simply a, a big piece of pipe that went down and turned like a J, so it was parallel to the seafloor. And when you wanted to install a pipeline, you simply pull the pipeline up the J-tube up to the top. A very simple, clean way of doing the installation. No welding, no fuss. So when you came to other floating structures, in this case a spar laying on its side, we started to use uh, the, the new variation of a J-tube, either called an I-tube or a pull-tube. But even the pull tube has to go through a transition into the structure. And what you have here is the very end of the pull tube, right where it goes through the final guide, is it's called a stress joint, SJ. And that stress joint has to be able to act as a curvature control for the pipe that runs inside it. And so this is a definitely an application of abacus, because you have pipe and pipe and a structural joint on the outside of it. So it's almost like a three-layer problem. The, uh, the results may not look spectacular, but those particular stresses that uh, are on the inside of that uh, uh, stress joint can get quite high. So for proper design, uh, all our systems that we ever do always have to go through a, an abacus analysis. One other thing I'll point out real quick is the displacement between that pipe and that guide is measured in millimeters. It's very small. It has to be free in order for thermal expansion. But you can imagine a 30,000 ton structure moving and that riser are tying it down to the seafloor. When those two collide at all, the forces are very high and they're very difficult to calculate. And again, that's another application we use for abacus. There's no other tools that can really do it. Uh, this slide here shows you the, the laws of superposition. Uh, what we actually do is we use abacus program with uh, proprietary subroutines that will feed into uh, Abacus the necessary uh, uh, features and parameters in order to model, in the first case, the vibration of a riser due to currents coming by it because the vortex is being shed. The next uh, program will actually give the uh, displacements of a riser that's being shielded by a riser in front of it because of the wakes coming off the first riser. And the third uh, program will actually feed Abacus with the motions that the, uh, the vessel is imposing. So if you, impo you put the same timeline by all three of these programs and then superimpose the stresses in the risers, uh, then you'll have the superposition of all the loads that riser experiences. And you have to do it this way because you're never really sure which one will be the principal force uh, controlling the design. Now we're going to go through a real lay installation of a rigid pipe. First of all, the pipes that we uh, install are not all just one piece of pipe. You know, the, the, the reeling of pipe goes back 30 years into the very beginning of my career. And it was always a question of the D over T ratio, the thickness over the diameter, in order to have enough uh, re residual strength. Uh, now today we, we not only do single pipes, but more often we do pipes with a lot of insulation on the outside, like the upper right-hand pipe, or we actually have pipe in pipe. What you don't see is a pipe that's inside all that wrapping. That's an uh, aspen aerogel blanket that's 98% uh, air, actually, and it's meant to uh, keep that pipe as warm as possible because uh, hydrates are a very big problem, and if you have a shut-in, you have a certain time that you're allowed to keep that pipe before you start to have the formation of hydrates. So, uh, and also the, uh, the flow characteristics of the oil are very uh, controlled by the temperature. So you want to keep it warm. Sometimes when you can't keep it warm, even with aerogel insulation, you have to do uh, electric uh, trace heating of the pipe, and that's the pipe on the bottom. We actually now are running wires and then annular space between the two pipes in order to uh, keep that pipe warm. All these pipes have to get reeled. Uh, they, first of all, are fabricated in two-mile lengths, which is why that spool base there has a two-mile run. And then you pull a two-mile length on, and you weld up another two-mile length, and you keep on pulling. That way, most of the welding you have to do on that pipeline system is done while the vessel is not there. OK, now we're going to go through a video. And the video is a first-end connection. And what you see here is the deep blue again, the vessel you saw before, running down one of those plets, and the pipeline's at the end of it. Now, you'll also see that little device there floating around as a remote-operated vehicle. I told you there was another invention that changed the subsea world. This is it, the ROV. Thirty years ago, we didn't, we didn't call it an ROV. We had a lot of funny names for it, but we basically knew what it was going to do. We just did not have all the technology yet to do it. Now we do have the technology, and the technology that was developed in the subsea world 
actually has been borrowed by NASA, and now that is the basis of a lot of what is done out in space. We were the pioneers in this remote operated vehicles. And there's a pile down there, it's a suction pile that serves as a hard point so that as you, when you lay away, you can actually lay that plate uh, down on the seafloor, and it has what they call a skirt around it that will go through the mud and give it lateral stiffness. The next one uh, is an uh, animation, but it's done in fast motion in order to uh, uh, speed up the operation. This is the second end. So this pipe now, you just consider the deep blue is moving away, you're reeling off pipe. Uh, by the way, that yellow thing there is a plate. It shows you about the size of one uh, that was just put down in the first animation. So the deep blue at this point here is actually uh, putting that into position for the, for the second end. And there is the pipe coming off as it's spooling. And of course, the vessel has to be moving all the time. And now it's coming down through, and eventually it's going to run out of pipe. And of course, offshore operations run 24 hours a day. They never stop. And here the pipe is going to be moved into position and to locked off in a, in a spider grip that allows it to be uh, held in that position so the, the plet can be put over the top. Now the plet will move into position. Preparations will be made. And then the curtain will come down for the welding and for the x-raying. This is a single station or welding operation. So there's no hanky-panky going on in there. It's simply, uh, there's a lot of sparks flying around and you don't want to have anybody near all the sparks when they fly around. And then you bring out the x-ray equipment and you don't want people around for that either. Uh, and eventually it's going to be pulled off and well, they'll put the field joint on it, which means if there was any uh, corrosion coatings or any other type of insulation or protection on all the other pieces of the pipe, now that joint will be field protected. And this is just a close-up of that field protection being put on, and you can see the peanut gallery there sitting watching and laughing. And now it's being lowered into the water, and away it goes. Okay, the plastic cycle. When we uh, actually load a piece of pipe on, it goes through a particular cycle. When it first gets loaded on, it goes up to the, uh, it goes elastic, then plastic when it goes onto the main reel. Uh, and then uh, when it uh, is, okay, well that's going all the way onto the reel in the reverse load. Now it goes up to what's called the, uh, the angler. Uh, that means it gets plastically deformed a second time because it has to go over the shiv. And the proper way of saying the word angler, you have to, I've always heard it done by a Scotsman. So it's angler. So uh, I've never heard that word in any other tone than angler. Because there's a, lots of Scotsmen in our crews uh, that uh, run our vessels. Okay, when it goes on the back side of the angler, it has to get straightened, reverse bend. Uh, that straightens the pipe, no residual uh, curvature. And then it's a straight piece of pipe when it gets through the tensioners and goes down the hole, or get actually down, down through the moon, excuse me, moon pool. Uh, that particular operation has several features that have to be analyzed uh, with abacus. One of them is the pipe overlaying the other pipe. The other one in the lower right is a discontinuity between two pipes. Many times you change wall thicknesses uh, for one reason or another, and when you do that, you create a stressing issue because the EI suddenly has a rapid transition and you have to use, look at abacus to make sure that that transition is properly done. You either have to put a taper on it of some form or a short pup that staggers the, uh, the wall thickness shift. The, uh, on the lower part center is where you actually have some uh, major transition in stiffness. And this is a case where you have, this is a pipe in pipe, and what you see there in those two blues are double bulkheads. Uh, within uh, the, the pipe and pipe acting as uh, barriers in the angular space and that creates a very stiff spot and uh, again abacus has to be used extensively to make sure there is no overstressing of the pipe when it goes on to the reel. 
Another issue we face with uh, uh, real pipe is cracks. Uh, it's one thing to look for cracks when you weld a pipe the first time for fatigue reasons, but if you're going to weld a pipe and then put it through reverse bending, those cracks get enhanced. Uh, and we use uh, Abacus in conjunction with uh, engineering uh, critical assessment in order to figure out exactly what is the allowable cracks. Because if you go too conservative, the cost of the repair rate and the production rates go, uh, uh, go against you. Uh, so that we don't want to be under conservative, we don't want to be over conservative, so we make the effort to be as exact as we can. And Abacus plays a principal role in all that analysis. Okay, now you get into the operations of a pipeline. Uh, they have very complex loading situations. Uh, another story from 38 years. One of the first pipelines put into the, uh, in the North Sea was a large gas pipeline. It came down the side of a platform and, and out, and they put a, uh, a clamp that attached the pipeline to a cross brace at the very base of the platform, a jacket. And two weeks later, somebody noticed uh, that that cross brace was missing that they started up that pipeline and the thermal growth and the high pressure end cap effect just knocked the cross brace out. So the oil industry is one that learns. So they figured, okay, we better start modeling how these pipelines behave on the seafloor. Uh, also, there's a lot of uh, complex soil uh, pipe interaction issues, which we're going to look at now. This is a simulation of a pipe going back and forth over the seafloor. Uh, the pipe is motion and its velocity are inputs. The loading on the pipe and the soil behavior are modeled by Abacus. Now I can tell you that uh, in the early days we actually had to lower a piece of pipe off a boat and drag it along the seafloor back in the 70s in order to figure out what those friction loads were and have a diver go down there and actually measure how big the burn was being created as you pull it across and back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it was very labor intensive and I know because I was a diver on it with Exxon that was doing those measurements. Uh, so uh, it was a very labor intensive process but now we have simulations that can uh, certainly cut down the time and save on the wear and tear. Okay, now we have pipelines sometimes that have to have a crossing of another pipeline. And to do that, you use what's called sleepers. Uh, these are, and we're going to show you a section of those sleepers right there. Uh, sleepers are concrete bars, almost like skid bars that are put on the seafloor. And it enables the pipeline to skid back and forth. If the pipeline is going to move uh, or buckle anywhere because of thermal growth or any other effects, it's going to do on the sleepers because they have lower friction than the soils do. Uh, you also notice those sleepers have no-goes at the end so that uh, if your calculations weren't quite right and the pipeline's about to come off the sleeper, then you have a block to stop it. That type of information allows you to model the entire pipeline with uh, quite uh, good accuracy. Here you have an umbilical. Uh, we mentioned those before. The big core in the middle is probably a methanol. That's to keep the hydrate formation in check. And those other bores that you see there uh, are the hydraulic lines I told you before. They're probably the most critical thing in the subsea fields. They have 15,000 PSI hydraulic fluid and the pressure has to stay on those lines. They keep all the valves open. You lose those lines, everything closes. Plus you have uh, the power lines and other things uh, in there. Uh, these umbilicals go through a rough life, uh, even if they're not going to be in a riser dynamic mode because they have to, first of all, get installed, which means they have to get wrapped up, unwrapped, and put on the seafloor. What we've developed here is a tool called Famous, and it allows you to uh, create a database based on uh, known inputs for a particular design. And that database uh, creates an Excel file, and the Excel file is designed to input directly into Abacus. So this is essentially building an Abacus model for further analysis. Uh, it's a very quick and simple tool. What used to take weeks to do can be done by a single designer now uh, in half a day, and done accurately, and most importantly, done consistently. So this is an example of where we have a tool that allows us to project this capability, design capability, out to other parts of the world, uh, yet have the quality control necessary.
I'm not going to show the animation when it's going to go on. One of the things that happens uh, to all umbilicals when they go through those uh, big uh, crawler crane uh, tractor treads uh, is they get crushed. You know, the old days when pipe lay was being first developed, they didn't use those big tractor treads to hold on to the pipe. They actually used op opposing tires. And uh, that was a lot more difficult because the loads were not very well distributed and you ended up with a lot of crushing. Uh, today, those tractor treads almost completely envelop the pipe and very uh, uniformly distribute uh, the load, which they have to do because in the old days, we were going down hundreds of feet. Now we're going down thousands of feet of water to hold on to these very heavy umbilicals. Uh, and the idea here is there's a safe uh, loading limit, a crushing limit, as you can see in the red line, and we have to stay within that, yet still have enough... Uh, force uh, from the caterpillar uh, uh, treads to hold that pipe. So it's a design issue of how heavy you can really make it, that you can still hold it in a certain water depth without crushing the elements. And of course, Abacus plays a key role in uh, the calculations of what is the deformation of the various pieces under the crushing loads. Finally, uh, we have what we call flow solids technology. This is fluidization of a, a solid stream. And that is done by uh, the solid stream is entered into the vessel and a, uh, a hot gas stream is entered uh, vertically from the bottom up. And that actually suspends the solids and creates the solids and the gas into a fluid. Uh, that en enables certain reactions to take place in a more advantageous uh, atmosphere, and that, which means quicker shorter residency time in the chamber. Uh, and CFD is used uh, extensively for locating where those jets are placed. Uh, FEA is used to make sure that pressure vessel under the pressure and temperatures will hold together. And the new term in there is uh, computational particle fluid dynamics, which is uh, used to model the actual geometries inside the nozzle in order to uh, make for the best mixing uh, of the overall stream. So there is a case uh, where all the different technologies are used, as, and this is used extensively, especially with uh, heavier crudes and uh, other uh, cracking processes. And finally, I'm going to uh, give a summary here. Coming out a little ahead of time, that's good. Uh, what we at Technip uh, understand that when we design things, especially for the oil and gas environment, you never do the same thing twice. Uh, flexibility is absolutely important because every problem we face is unique. So even though it may look alike, it's not. And we need tools like Abacus uh, and other tools of Simulea to help us modify every design we do in order to optimize it. And that second bullet is one of the key drivers to keep it safe. Yes, you'd like to be economical. Yes, you'd like to do it in a quicker period of time. But you can only do that if you're absolutely certain of safety. And again, that's where Abacus comes in, in uh, and the various other tools of Simulea in order to make sure that we are safe at all times. In order to remain uh, on top of this industry, you have to remain engaged with the technology. And we are in material sciences and hydrodynamics, and you saw the numerical wave basin, which is uh, something that's very new. Uh, but we also have to stay engaged with uh, software companies like Simulea, because not only are they forever inventing new simulation techniques, but they're joining up various tools to give us new technology or new capabilities we didn't have before. So uh, we have to stay abreast of not only the base technologies, but also the tool systems that you're using. One thing I've learned after 38 years of dealing with technology is uh, use technology innovation when you need to. Don't if you don't. I mean, every one of these projects you see offshore today have enough risks involved in it that if you don't have a demonstrable impact uh, on the outcome with an innovation, you probably don't want to go there. And that's essentially why this industry, the oil industry, the operators are extremely conservative and it's very hard to introduce innovation to them. 
Uh, they are usually uh, wanting to stick with what they know for very good reason. There's so many risks in other parts of their business. And finally, uh, one of the issues that faces our industry today is we have to operate all over the world. We just don't operate out of our ivory towers in the United States and in Europe. We have to operate in all the new exploration areas from China to Mozambique, Brazil, KL, uh, Jakarta, uh, you name it. Uh, and they all, all those countries want to use the oil industry and the exploitation of their reservoirs as an enabling event for them to step up. So they want local content. So we have to develop technologies, designs, and use tools that we can project out in the field and support. So having a company like Simulea that has support capability throughout the world is absolutely vital to us. Otherwise, we'd have to internally support all our tools, and quite frankly, uh, that's a daunting challenge, and we'd rather not be in the software business. We'd rather be in the engineering solution business, uh, in the energy industry. So ladies and gentlemen, that is my last slide, and I thank you.